Hey, this is CD Channel. I'm Chris. This is MMA for you. I'm going to be doing my post fight analysis for UFC 164. Uh, before I get into that, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Born to Fight Kimonos. Uh, if you're looking for MMA gear, go to uh, Born to Fight Kimonos. Find it on like Facebook and whatnot. Um, bonuses. Uh, Anthony Pettis got submission of the night. Um, Chad Mendes got knockout of the night. And uh, Gyung Hu Lim versus Pascal Cross got fight of the night. Uh, overall, good card. Uh, top to bottom, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, there was, <laughs> I mean, there was like worst fight of the year here, best round of the year, questionable judging, questionable uh, refing. Overall, great finishes, great fights though. Uh, a lot of divisional relevance. Got a new champion um, with a lot of contenders. I, I'll definitely get into that. Uh, my picks were pretty crappy, <laughs> um, and people have brought up that my picks have been uh, pretty bad as of late. Um, you know, it sucks. I, I'm try. You know, I, I definitely try to be a little more analytical when I do like prediction videos. And whatnot. Um, if I, uh, a pick is an emotional pick, I will definitely, you know, uh, bring it up that it's an emotional pick. Um, unfortunately, I mean, the way it works as far as like my own credibility, it's if I don't pick good, then, you know, it doesn't lend credence to like my credibility as far as analyzing fights. Um, it's just the way it is too, you know, like, and, and the way I analyze too, like for example, like Court McGee versus Robert Whitaker that just happened. I didn't pick it right. I mentioned that Court McGee has a way of fighting that like outworks opponents, high output and whatnot. Robert Whitaker, you know, he's got solid takedown fence, good counter punching. I pick Whitaker to win, and the fight happened like that. But one guy's strategy beat the other guy's strategy. Um, you know, so I, I try not to look, you know, I'm, I'm trying to sound like I know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, but unfortunately, you know, when I have bad picks, it makes it seem like I really don't know what I'm talking about. I, I like to think I do, but, you know, obviously my results don't show that. Um, this particular card, two fights in particular, Poirier versus Coke and Pettis versus Henderson, really doesn't lend credence to my credibility. Um, what I said and analyzed about these two fights went a totally different way, and actually Elliot versus Gotti now too, went a totally different way, uh, the fight went a totally different way than what I thought it would go. So definitely my, my credibility is kind of shot right now. Um, I'm hoping that I can do good picks for the Glover Teixeira versus uh, Ryan Bader fight. Uh, and that UFC fight night, what, 28-29? Um, I think it's 28. I'm not too sure. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, there's a lot to talk about with this card. Uh, um, so let's get started. Uh, Anthony Pettis beat Benson Henderson by a verbal submission uh, as an armbar in the first round. Um, you know, I was, and I think a lot of people were thinking that this fight would be a lot more competitive. I mean, obviously there's going to have those guys that would have thought Pettis by finish in the first round or second round. And there's going to have those guys, but from what I've read, um, from most people's predictions, they thought it'd be pretty competitive. It really wasn't that isn't that much, you know. At best, Benson Henderson did manage to clinch him up against a cage. I thought he would do that. Um, otherwise, he wasn't able to complete takedowns. Um, that one time he did manage to take Pettis down, he got armbarred. Uh, it's kind of crazy because uh, Benson Henderson, BJJ black belt, just got it relatively recently. And he's notorious for not tapping out the submissions. You can watch the first Donald Cerrone fight. 
Um, you can watch the uh, bow check fight. He got a you know, pretty deep darts choke. Um, among other fights, and Venton Henderson never tapped. Um, you know, after a loss like this, th there really isn't a need for a trilogy either. You know, so it's, it kind of puts Benson Henderson in a holding pattern in the division. Is he the guy? Is he the John Fitch? Or how Vitor's kind of in that, that spot right now where he knocks off contenders but won't get a title shot? Or is that, you know, you lost twice to this guy now, to uh, Anthony Pettis now, you know? He got submitted in the first round. It's, you know, I don't think anyone wants to see a rematch. I think Henderson, if he gets a title shot, it's going to have a really long road uh, ahead of him. You know, um, definitely completes Anthony Pettis' journey. Um, unfortunately, uh, I read that he, does ha he did uh, sustain a knee injury and that he will be out. Um... But you know, this is a uh, this is really good for the lightweight division, just because you definitely have a fighter in Anthony Pettis who is aesthetically pleasing. Um, you know, he has really fun fights. He's a fin a known finisher and uh, spectacular finishes as well. It's not just like. You know, some ground and pound here and there. It's like head kicks, body kicks, you know, um, pettis kicks, <laughs> showtime kicks, you know, arm bars from guard, you know, which is so hard to get at this level of, uh, you know, competition. You know, um, he honestly, Benson Henderson, I mean, he just, he. I, you know, it's a combination of things, you know, getting those close fights and whatnot, but he just doesn't connect with the fans as well, as, as far as being, like, something of a draw. Uh, I think a lot of people were thinking, like, uh, it, it's a matter of time before he loses, because he's not dominant, and I think that really hurt him, too. Pettis, though, I mean, you know, his last three victories were pretty dominant. Lozon, Cerrone, now Benson Henderson. There are no shortage of contenders. <laughs> TJ Grant would probably be the best um, next contender. And, and that'll be really interesting. I, I really like TJ Grant. Totally underrated fighter. Um, you know, style I would favor Pettis against any one of these guys, by the way, that I'm going to uh, mention. Um, stylistically, it, it's a good fight because uh, Grant is a pressure fighter, and Benson was mentioning, yeah, make him back up a lot, you know? So, that's not to say that it's going to guarantee a, a win for the opponent. It's far from it, actually. <laughs> There's his footwork, really good. He, he makes really subtle movements uh, to change angles uh, for his strikes and whatnot. And he's really content off his back. And he's shown down really good take on fence. Just a really well-rounded guy. Uh, really young, too. You know, doesn't sustain too much damage in his fights. Um, the only thing that sucks for him is he does tend to hit the injury bug a couple times. But, I mean, you can give him TJ Grant next. Uh, if Gilbert Melendez beats uh, Diego Sanchez. I mean, a lot of people thought Melendez beat Benson Henderson. Um, people feel very highly of Get Gilbert Melendez. That'd be a great fight, you know. I don't know who Josh Thompson is going to fight next after he uh, knocked out uh, Nate Diaz, but um, he'll probably get another fight, but Thompson versus Anthony Pettis would be pretty cool too. And uh, Rafael Dos Anjos coming off that big win over Donald Cerrone. Um, you know, he's firmly entrenched in the top 10 now. Um, uh, shown to be a greatly improved fighter uh, he'd be an interesting challenge as well and of course uh, Anthony Ferris called out none other than uh, Jose Aldo okay, he can either fight at 145 or 155 um, Aldo's manager wants if that fight happens it'll be at 145 as far as a kind of like a dream fight it'd be cool it'd be really cool to watch as far as, you know, right now I mentioned four guys that, that honestly, let's see, um, you know, Grant, Melendez, Thompson, Desanos, 
I mentioned four guys already that, you know, are one fight or, or, you know, just should be the next contender, you know? Um, there's already a log jam at 155. I mean, that, those are four very worthy challengers, all interesting fights for ben, uh, Anthony Pettis. And, you know, I'd like to see Pettis stay at 155, clear up the log jam. Um, and, you know, like I said, I'd favor him against all these guys. I think he's a little too tough to take down. He's, you know, he works off his back really well. His stand-up, I think he is pretty much ahead of everyone else's stand-up in the division. You know? Um, so, yeah, he, he could, could he be, like, the one, the BJ Penn, well, you know, when he was that, the one, the one dominant champion, the GSP, um, Anderson for a longest time, the John Jones, could he be the dominant champion? Yeah, you know, I mean, he, he, he already made a statement here, first round submission over Benson Henderson. Um... You know, it kind of sucks, though, that, that there isn't going to have a rubber match, or pr most likely won't. Um, trilogies like this definitely lend itself to building a division. Um, you know, because there's a story of, like, Anthony Pettis beat Benson Henderson in his hometown to win the WC title. Now they're Benson Henderson's the UFC champion, in Anthony Pettis' hometown, you know, if the story went like, oh, Benson Henderson won, somehow, even controversially, you know, whatnot, people would probably want to see the trilogy, you know? Now, that doesn't happen. But, 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 Anthony Pettis, like I said, extremely remarkable guy, huge star power, I mean, the guy was in World of Jinx, uh, he was in, like, some life of an MMA fighter, uh, thing as well you know definitely has a lot of star power um highly remarkable really fun fights you know um seems like a good guy outside the cage you know i think he has his own taekwondo school you know one or two if i'm not mistaken you know uh family man you know i think he always mentions his kids you know um Part owner of the Rufus Sport, if I'm not mistaken. Now, you know, uh, good guy. You know, just really good for the division. And, and he himself, with his style and, and whatnot, could potentially uh, elevate the division. You know, he, he might be just that dominant champion that the division really needs. But he definitely has some tough competition uh, ahead of him. If he does fight Aldo. That'd be a really cool fight. I'd love to see it at 145 or 155. You know, um, either weight class would be really cool. Um, but right now, I, I personally would like to see Anthony Pettis staying at 155. Um, Benton Henderson needs a fight next. Uh, I'd probably give him, like, uh, probably uh, Gray Maynard would be a good uh, matchup because he's coming off a loss to Pettis, but is still, like, uh, still up there. Uh, he can also get the loser of Melendez versus Diego Sanchez. Um, so, yeah, there's still good fights for him, but, you know, he, he's definitely at a holding pattern at 155 at this time. Okay, next fight after that, Josh Barnett beat Frank Mir by TKO in the first round. Um, you know, th there's a lot of controversy here because of whether or not it's an early stoppage. I thought the stoppage was fine. But it could have gone in a little more. Maybe three or four more punches. I mean, it, but it's one of those differences of being like... Frank Mir just fell like a sack of potatoes after the knee. He, his arms were flailing around. And then, he, he, you know, it's a flash knockout, you know? Do you really want to risk this guy's health? Does he really need to be knocked out cold to, def to really say, hey... Like, okay, Barnett won. Cool, let's give this guy, you know... <laughs> I mean, Mir's been not... Most of his losses, I think almost all except like one of his losses have been by knockout. And then a lot of fights, he gets wobbled. I mean, it's like Nogueira in the second time. He gets wobbled. Um, so, you know, I thought it was a fight. You know, like, at the same time, I thought the ref looked out for the safety of the fighter. So, 
in the sense, I, I don't think it was the worst thing in the world. And I think it was pretty definitive that Burnett more than likely would have uh, knocked out Mir out cold. <laughs> Uh, this is three losses in a row for Frank Mir now. I mean, he needs to get... They should probably just give him, like, a mid-tier guy. Like, maybe the winner or loser of Shaw versus Mitrione or something like that. Just, you know, he, I think at this point... Because he's only been fighting, like, the best guys. You know, Junior Santos, Daniel Cormier, Josh Barnett. It's... They're, respect they're all very respectful losses for Frank Mir, you know. Uh, but, yeah, three losses in a row. It, you know, I don't think he's going to get his, uh, he's going to get cut or anything because he's Frank Mir, you know, well-known, main evented a lot of uh, UFC's former champ, you know, has a na has name value. Um, still a relatively good fighter, you know. Um... You know, he's the main event for UFC 100, you know. But, you know, he's also, he's on TRT now. Um, he's getting older, and his chin's not getting better. I mean, the guy keeps getting knocked out. Uh, he, he might want to, you know, think about maybe hanging them up, hanging up the glove soon because, you know, He's got knocked out a lot. I mean, what can I say? You know, um, I've, obviously it's not my choice to make or anything like that. But you know, it's just something to think about. Uh, Josh Burnett, though, man, good, great strategy from the guy. You know, and, and a strategy that works really well for him. Those uppercuts and knees from the clinch against the man. Mir cannot handle the clinch against the cage very well. It is just not his place. He just gets overwhelmed. There, when guys can just body him against the cage. Daniel Cormier was able to do it. Shane Carlin, uh, Lesnar, like the second time, you know, um, he completed ta like takedowns against the cage as well. On Mir, um, just can't handle it. And Barnett, great strategy, putting Mir up against the cage and using really effective dirty boxing, you know, uppercuts and knees. To eventually get the stoppage. There's a point in the fight where you can just kind of tell, man, Mir is wilting right now. And yeah, he dropped like a sack of potatoes, you know. Uh, Josh Barnett, you know, uh, I think he gets like a Verdum next, or maybe Travis Brown, or the winner of Daniel Cormier versus Roy Nelson, possibly. I know he lost to Cormier. Wouldn't really want to see that fight, but you know, Nelson wins somehow. Maybe you can give him Josh Barnett, you know. So, yeah. Good win for Barnett. Great return for the UFC. Okay, next one after that. Chad Money Mendez beat Clay to Carbon Guida by TK on the third round. Who's done that to Clay Guida? I've seen Guida get dropped. I've seen him get wobbled. But I've, ne I've never seen him get, like, TKO'd. I think he could have probably maybe taken some more punches. I, I you know, some people were, were calling early stoppage here as well, but I thought it was fine, you know. Um, man, you know, you, you can't discount Dwayne Ludwig and his coaching and Team Alpha Male. One guy did point this out, though. Um, you know, the guys that they, uh, you know, like Benavides, Dillashaw, Faber, and Mendez, that they're fighting, because those are the guys that are winning a lot. You know, would they be those guys even without Ludwig? Yes. Would they be knocking out these guys? Mm, I don't know. I mean, it, it's really tough to say. I mean, obviously, a Yeltsin, Mazza, or Cody McKenzie, yeah, he, yeah, he knocks those guys out pretty easily. Uh, and then Alkins and Aguida without Ludwig? I don't know, you know, because you even heard in the corner, I, I someone pointed this out too. That I believe, um, I believe Ludwig was saying, okay, you know, hit, hit him with the counter right. Guess what happened? Hit him with the counter right, drops his ass, you know, and uh, finishes up, you know, finishes up. Does that happen without Ludwig calling the counter right? Probably not, actually, if you really think about it, you know. And a lot of these fighters will credit, oh, yeah, I was working on this particular combo with uh, Ludwig the other day. I think Dillashaw was mentioning something with that the kick that dropped uh, 
Jeez, I forgot who it was. Um, uh, I, uh, Von, I think it was like Von Lee or something like that. Um, you know, they all credit. Yeah, oh yeah, I practice. You know, we practice that uh, with Ludwig. You know, so obviously, I, I, you know, he's definitely helping the um, the team Alpha Male guys really refine their striking for sure. Man, is good. You know, there's a good amount of guys that Mendes can fight. You know, I think he's the number two guy in the division. I actually think like Pat Curran or maybe even Frank Edgar are the number two guys. But uh, there's Ricardo Lamas. Uh, rematch with Cub Swanson, Frankie Edgar, um, Guida can get like Dennis Seaver or maybe the loser of uh, Nick Lentz versus D D uh, Dennis Bermudez. You know, um, great win for Mendez. You know, it, he's just been knocking dudes out. You know, he he really should be getting uh, a rematch against Aldo soon. I, I I believe Dana White said that he doesn't like giving rematches to guys. That have been finished. Um, I kind of hate that rule, to be perfectly honest with you. But um, you know, this guy keeps finishing guys and tough guys to finish. You know. Um, so yeah, great one for Mendes here. Next fight after that, Ben Rothwell, TK Brandon Vera uh, in the third round. Brandon Vera's gonna get. He should be cut from the UFC. He's not a UFC caliber fighter anymore. Even against Elliot Marshall, he struggled. He's just so timid in the cage now. You know, um, it just doesn't look good, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, uh, and and it, it's mental. And, and the, the fact of the matter is, if Van Rivera gets cut and goes to World Series of Fighting or Bellator, I think he might even struggle, to be perfectly honest with you. If Vera fights Anthony Rumble Johnson, I think Rumble crushes uh, Vera, to be honest with you. I think if Vera fights like a King Mo in Bellator, Mo would win. I think if he, if, and at heavyweight, if he fought maybe, I don't know if he'd lose to Volkov, but, you know, Volkov's got a better mental game than Vera, <laughs> you know, and even a Vitaly Minikov, you know, undefeated Russian prospect, he's going to fight Volkov. I think he beats Vera, to be perfectly honest with you, man. You know, um, this this is kind of interesting, though, because uh, Ben Rothwell called out Travis Brown. Uh, Brown on Twitter said no and kind of just laughed in his face, <laughs> uh, which is understandable because Brown's coming off a big win over Overeem and Gonzaga. Rothwell's coming off a loss over Gonzaga and just beat uh, Brandon Vera. You know, so it, they're not in the same place and the heavyweight ladder. However, there are good fights for Rothwell. I think he can get like a Sean Jordan who's coming off a big win over Pat Berry. Or maybe a returning like Todd Duffy, you know. Um, there's some good fights for him. You can also give him maybe, if you want to give him a, a bit of a step up, Steep Amy You know, wouldn't it be a bad fight for Rothwell as well? Um, as far as the fight goes, uh, you know, I mean, first two rounds, weren't the greatest. Vera's doing the right strategy, but his output sucks sometimes. Um, and in the third round, Ben Rothwell was pretty much doing, like, I mean, he was kind of taunting him, and it worked. And it was, like, funny to watch. But it was cool because it worked. You know, he kept, like, moving his head erratically side to side and just moving almost, like, erratically. And just rushes Vera and then TKO's the guy, you know? Good stuff from Ben Roth. Oh, definitely just one of those guys that's like, um, still manages to stay in the UFC, you know. He'll, he'll get some bad losses here. And he'll get good, good wins, though, too, you know. I mean, he had that good win over Brendan Schaub. Where Brendan Schaub was pretty much, like, reaching for, like, <laughs> reaching for something in the air that wasn't there, you know. Um, but, yeah, good win for Rothwell. Yeah, next fight after that, Dustin Poirier beat uh, Eric Koch by unanimous decision. Uh, man, I, I call this fight really bad, you know. Uh, definitely not one of my best predictions. I What I said was that they are like the same fighter, except that Dustin Poirier is worse defensively than Eric Koch. Then when the fight happened... <laughs> Dustin Poirier was knocking Eric Koch down in the mat and hitting him almost at will a, a lot of times. 
definitely one of my worst predictions uh, and my, one of my worst analysis. Um, they are very similar. You know, Eric Koch showed a very good ground game against uh, Dustin Poirier with the close triangle chokes and whatnot. Poirier's stand-up was far superior. Uh, Poirier almost got a Darce choke on Eric Koch as well. You know, Eric Koch managed to take his back in the third round. I gotta say that the first round was probably one of the best rounds of the year in MMA. I mean, the near finishes and whatnot. Great stuff from both of these guys. You know, both young guys. Eric Koch, I know a lot of people say this, didn't look that bad uh, in losing just because of his spirited effort. Uh, he's gonna watch out for, you know, I think he's pretty susceptible to ground and pound. Uh, he's gotta watch out for that, man. <laughs> I, Lamas like rearranges his face, uh, but yeah, he seems pretty susceptible to ground pounds. He's got to watch out for that in the future. Uh, as far as uh, Poirier, you know, he can get uh, Carl Lamas. I know he called out Cub Swanson. Doesn't need to fight that guy uh, yet because Swanson's really doing well. But I'm thinking maybe the winner of Lance versus Bermudez and Eric Co can maybe get the loser of that fight or. Maybe someone more like mid to mid level or something like that. Okay, next fight after that, Grayson Tebow beat Jamie Varner by split decision. Uh, yeah, you know this was a Tebow fight. You know he managed to get the takedown, stay on top, and you know in the stand up he does well enough sometimes. In the third round though he's getting busted up um, by Varner, but it was just too little, too late for Varner. Um, and then Debo just kind of keeps proving that he can beat mid-tier, mid-level guys. Maybe a little higher because Jamie Varner is a really good fighter. Uh, but he can't beat the top 10 guys. He's not beating the Jim Millers. You know. Um, which is funny actually because he beat Rafael Dos Anjos. So maybe he is a top guy. But you know. He never beats the guys when they're at that level. You know. Um, and, and he can't. Because guys that can defend his takedowns and beat him up on the feet generally beat Glace and Tebow. It's just whether you can do that or not. Um, you know, I'm thinking with Varner, the Varner versus Cerrone fight makes a lot of sense uh, these days. I think that that's a fight they should go with. Tebow, you know, um, it's tough to say. Do you get more mid level guys for him to take down? <laughs> Or, like, do you give him another top guy, you know? But, like, a lot of the top guys, I mean, you're talking Melendez, Grant, Thompson, rematch with Desanos. Do you give him someone come off a loss like a Cerrone? Um, maybe a Maynard versus Tebow? Wouldn't it be too bad, even though it's a guy coming off a loss over a guy coming off a win? You know, I guess you can do that. But, yeah, this is Tebow, you know? 25, you know? really quietly getting like the most fights in the UFC and he's like one of the few UFC lifers you know he'll win a couple lose one win a couple lose one you know yeah that's him in a nutshell <laughs> you know what I mean um next right after that Tim Elliott beat Luis Godino by unanimous decision great stuff from Elliott this guy is not the most technically sound guy but on the, on the feet but he makes up for that with pressure, output, cardio. Um, his wrestling's really good. His, uh, submission defense is really good. Ground pound's really good. He's always busy. I'm curious to see with, with Elliot if, you know, because Dodson beat him, but that was actually a really close fight. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering with Elliot if his like unorthodox and this like almost reckless style of stand up and non technical stand up will eventually cost them against some guys. Um I'd like to see it though, you know, I, I'm curious. Because uh, he's a really fun fighter to watch. He does some pretty crazy things. Um I'd like to see him get the winner of Lineker versus Harris uh next. Um Maybe go with Elliot versus uh, Ian Uncle Creepy McCall. That'd be pretty cool as well. Because McCall's coming off that win over. Jeez, um, I've got the guy's name. That Brazilian dude. 
Um, I don't know if you want to give him someone too high up, like a Joseph Benavides or anything like that, but uh, there are some fun fights from him at Flyweight for sure. And he's a really interesting fighter because he's definitely technically flawed, but he definitely he also makes up for it as well. Um, with Gotti now, you know, he just he had no answer for Elliott's offense, you know. He's a good fighter, solid fighter, he's always game, but, you know, just couldn't handle the pressure. He used to just fight more like lower to mid-tier guys in the division. And next one, after that, hung Yu Lim beat Pascal Kraus by uh, TKO in the first round. Uh, man, this guy, second time in a row, win with, a knee, with knees, man. He has some good knees, big for the weight class. I will say this, the guy has some really strong offense, but some weak defense. Definitely needs to get that addressed, though. Because uh, against some of the better guys of the division, that, that's not going to cut it. You know, you can't just stand in front of guys and take punches and you know, trade punches, you know. Uh, I think this is also showing that Korea is producing some top-level MMA fighters, you know. hung Yu Lim, Dong Hyun Kim, Kyung Hyo Kang. Um, you know, there's probably some other uh, prospects in Korea that we don't know about that, you know, that are probably pretty good, you know. Uh, I like what I see from uh, Lim's defense, uh, offense, my bad, <laughs> his offense. Uh, I just like to see him get more uh, lower to mid-tier guys in the division. Kraus, same, it's more lower to mid-tier guys in the division, I suppose, you know. Um, but yeah. Really funny about this fight card that you see a Rufus Sport guy versus a Korean guy. Um, I mean, and, and you know the Kung, the Kang versus Kamis fight, Cross versus Lim, and even to an extent Pettis versus Henderson because Henderson is half Korean. You know, uh, um, so it's really interesting to see. Um, but yeah. Uh, I'm curious to see where Lim, Lim goes from here. You know, I think he, he's a pretty good prospect at 170. Um, like his offensive arsenal. Super good knees. Um, curious to see where he goes from here. Next one, I thought Chico Canis beat uh, Kyung Hyo Kang by a uh, unanimous decision. I'm going to say this. I don't think the fight was a robbery. I think there was definitely, there was definitely a case for Chico Canis 29-28. I think 30-27 is pretty much unjustified for Chico Camus. First round, I mean, King was on top of him like the whole round. He did hit some ground and pound. It wasn't like he was just laying on him the whole time, trying to pass his guard and whatnot. I personally had the fight 29-28 for King. Um, you know, the second round could have gone either way. That could be a 10-10 because, you know, in the first half of that round... Kang was on top. Next half of the round, Camus was on top. And then in the next one, um, Camus was beating up Kang on the feet for a little while. Kang was on top for a long time. Camus managed to get the up kick, and that was like the deciding factor of that. Um, but yeah, I, I personally had it for 29-28 uh, Kang. I think a lot of people found this decision to be quite contentious, especially 30-27, I mean, that is just, I, I thought that was just uh, absolutely unjustified, um, regardless, you know, Camus was coming off a loss over Dustin Kamara, he's coming off a uh, win over Kang here, you know, um, it's hard to say if Camus is really, like, I don't know if he's that much of a prospect, you know, um, sometimes he seems a little too, in, you know, inclined to go to the ground with a guy who's straight, you know, to grapple with the grappler. Um, and I, I, it definitely costs him against Dustin Kamara. Because he's better on the feet than a lot of uh, these guys. But sometimes he, he either gets taken down or, in the Dustin Kamara fight, chooses to take, you know, the grappler down. Um, I think that will cost him in the future. He's got definitely got to watch out for that. Um, with Kang, I, I like what I, I keep like liking what I see from this guy, except his uh, defense in the stand up. You know, that's the only thing I don't like. But otherwise, I like this fight against Caceres. 
I think Tank's a hell of a grappler, you know? Some of his reversals are just sick, man. I was just like, wow, I, I did not expect him to be able to... He's on bottom, all of a sudden he's on top, and I'm like, wow, that came out of nowhere. I, and and he's big for the weight class, really tall. Um, his grappling is really strong. Um, and, you know, definitely needs some work there even. Um, but... You know, uh, or he needs some work in the stand-up defense, but I, I like what I see from the guy. Uh, I think he, he's a quality Korean talent um, in the UFC. Uh, just more lower to mid-tier guys for both these fighters. Okay, next right after that, so Pelele beat Nikita Krylov by Tiko in the third round. Most people, I think Dana White included, pretty much said that this was the worst fight of the year. I have to say, it was so bad, it was kind of funny. I mean, it's like laughably bad because they are just so gassed by like, what, like the second round. That it was almost just, it was like comical how they were fighting each other, you know. Um, it, yeah, you know, good win for Pelé. I mean, like, oh no, I mean, he... Pelele, I guess, gets to keep his job, pretty much, uh, in the UFC. There's not much to say. It's just, like, the sloppiest. They were so tired, and the fight was just so sloppy. Curl, at the very least, he's 21 years old. Didn't show the worst guard game. He, you know, he's not that bad off his back. You know, just that he definitely needs a lot of work. But he, at least he's got youth, you know, uh... I don't know, Pelele and just more lower to mid tier guys of his division, I suppose. You know, I mean, I don't really know what to say. I mean, yeah, a lot of people, this is a consensus, like, worst fight of the year, you know. Next right after that, Al Iaquinta beat Ryan Couture by unanimous decision. I think Ryan Couture should be cut after this fight. Two losses in a row. He just doesn't seem like a UFC caliber guy. He's not particularly athletic. Doesn't have a particularly great skill set or anything like that. He's game. That's I'll give him that. Lots of heart, but you know he's. I, I don't think he cut, cuts the mold uh, really well. Cuts the mold. Uh, you know I. Uh, I just don't think he, he's a UFC caliber guy. I like what I saw from Al Iaquina though, man. It, you know, he'd slip punches. Um, you know, and he'd counter his right hand. Uh, his right hand. Yeah. I think, uh, found its mark on Ryan Couture's head all day. He'd go to the body. I liked what I saw from his boxing, you know, just good stuff. Um, he used Ryan Couture like a heavy bag. Defended takedowns well, you know, good wrestler. Just, I'm curious to see, uh, where he goes from here. He's just got more lower to mid-tier guys. You know, just a decent prospect, you know. He's, uh, he's with a really good camp, still a young guy. Pretty good skill set. Uh, I'll keep an eye out for him. And finally, Magnus Sedenblad beat Jared Hammond by guillotine in the first round. You know, Hammond wasn't doing bad in the stand-up. You know, uh, I don't really know why he went for takedowns. And it he it cost him 57 seconds in the first round. You know, you got guillotine choked. You know, um... Not great for Hammond. Uh, I think he's probably going to get cut because he lost to Michael Kuyper in his last fight. He got finished, you know, and now he got guillotined. Uh, he takes a lot of damage in his fights in general. Um, I can see him get cut. With Seven Blood, you know, just more lower to mid tier guys in the division. You know, can't really say too much about him. Uh, I don't know if he'll turn out to be a good prospect or not. He called out Dylan Andrews, which actually doesn't sound like the worst fight. I think that's actually a pretty good fight uh, for these guys. Okay, and that's pretty much it for my uh, post-fight analysis for UFC 164. If you guys have any comments, just leave them below. And that's it for MMA for you. Thank you guys very much.